Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. This is where chicken soup for the soul meets the artist way with Nancy Drew. Our guest today is Stephen Manchester, author of The Thursday Night Club. We're going to be chatting with him today all about his newest film adaption and a moment when a friend supported him through a tough time. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much, Laurie. It's great to be here. I'm honored. I'm very thrilled to have you back with us. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed the first time, and in, in when you know when we talked about me coming back, and then it being the Thursday Night Club, uh, which has really had its own life cycle. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and share this with you, your audience. It is. I'm excited to dive into it because as we were talking about before the show, it was one of the best feel good shows I've watched in a while. And so I'm Wonderful. excited to dive into that with you. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. We, we really appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. It is Valentine's Day week, Steve. Yes. It's something that you have done the past week to show love toward yourself. Yeah, I, I well, I've been really busy doing a lot of writing. Um, we just wrapped up a, a book, Simon Peter. I'm, I'm uh, you know, getting into talks with uh, Hotlight Entertainment for another project. So I'm beyond excited. I'm, I really feel like I'm in such a great place, and it's taken me a long time, like decades, to get where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I feel at peace with it. But I've been allowing myself more time to rest. Um, you know, do some more exercise. You know body, mind, spirit. Um, I'm really good at one of them at a time, right? But it's striking that balance. Um, if I get in front of a laptop and I'm on something pretty heavy, I want to stick to it. If I'm in the gym, then it becomes a, an obsession with that. So really, really, I'm trying to focus on on getting all three, right? And, and I think I've done a pretty good job over the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That awareness is hugely supportive to yourself. Right. <laughs> Yeah, without it, I, I think, you know, you always feel like something's a little bit off, and it, and it is, right? So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, um, you know, my faith, practicing my faith, which is, you know, just doing what I do, and then uh, obviously anything to do with the mind. I'm so busy with the writing and the research, which I love, and I can get lost in, so I'm kind of living in two worlds at one time, right? Whatever I'm writing, and then, you know, um, and then it becomes the body, right, where it's like, all right. I don't get to enjoy those other two elements if I don't take care of the third. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you share with our listeners and viewers what the Thursday Night Club is all about? Well, I got to tell you, and if I can go back um, to when it first started, I, I was, uh, my wife and I rented a house on Martha's Vineyard. We had a friend who had a friend, and, you know, we were able to afford the house and bring all the kids over. The problem was, you have to bring the vehicle over on a ferry, right? So we got the house from Saturday to Saturday. Uh, I could only get on the ferry on Friday. So one of us is going to be homeless that night. And I'm certainly not going to let my wife sleep in a park, right? So I figured, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't slept in a car since college. So let me go over. And I took the first ferry into Oak Bluffs. Uh, there's a place called Island Park, which has a gazebo right in the middle of it. And it's like hitting Powerball, right? If you can get into one of the parking spaces, right? And then it only allows you four hours to park. So I circle like a seagull. We're talking like late July, early August. I finally find a spot. I swoop in. I, I get out, backpack, pens, you know, pads of paper, like just heaven, right? No distractions. I don't have to feel guilty about anything. I'm there for my family, you know, doing a good thing. But then I decide, you know, what? I'm going to write a story and I'm going to take one day to do it. Right. Almost like an old like Kerouac or some of these older writers would just sit down at a teletype and go at it. And when the paper ran out or, you know, time ran out, they, they were done. But it was a one one time stop. So I wanted to do that. And it seemed a little odd to me that, again, the seagulls are screeching. Kids are, you know, flying kites. It's a beautiful, like a hot day. But you get a summer breeze. And I'm writing a Christmas story about five friends. <laughs> um, one of them suffers this tragedy. And as a result, and, and this person who suffers a tragedy is basically the best of them, right? Somebody who inspires other people to do kind things. And um, so in the original story, and we had to tweak it a little bit um, for the film, but in the original story, they end up running this contest. Whoever commits the greatest deed by Christmas night wins the pot. And because they're college kids and they're poor, and the Thursday Night Club really is based upon them getting together, right? And having these potluck dinners on Thursdays. Um, whoever wins the pot, 
or who wins the contest wins the pot, which is four quarters in a peanut jar, right? And uh, and they go out into the world. And really, this is me writing for my kids, right? So that's how I knew I got it right because the intentions were very, very pure. And we all know, right? Kids don't listen; they watch. So if I'm not doing something for other people, I can't tell my kids to do that. So I'm, you know, I'm writing the story. It takes me about 14 hours, Laurie, to finish it at least the first draft of it. And and I, I loved it. And I called my wife and I said, I think I got it right. And, you know, as a fellow writer, we don't always get it right. You're not sure. Uh, but this one, I, I could feel it, right? Like in my bones. And I'm like, I think I think we really get this one right. And she said, how do you know? I said, because it's for the kids and it's something I want them to read. Uh, but it's really about people doing something for somebody else who could never pay it back. Mm -hmm. also remain anonymous by doing that, right? So and what they learn, and this is me, you know, going into the Gulf War and coming home and my grandfather, who was like the sage in my life, right? I was having a really, really difficult time. And he said, listen, you know, if you dig somebody out of their troubles, you'll always find a place to bury your own. So I started mm -hmm. doing volunteer work for people who had it much worse than I did. And I lost myself in it. And suddenly my, my issues don't, you know, seem as bad. You know, I'm devoting my energy toward doing something for other people. And... It was better than therapy at the time. It was better than medicine. Like it really, really helped to save me, you know, to, to make it back, right? At least, um, you know, mentally from war. Mm -hmm. So um, the Thursday Night Club's always been a really, really special project for me. It started that way. Um, it's, again, it's, I, I love finally realizing that, you know, as a man of faith, like I'm, I'm on the bus. I used to think I drove the bus, right? I always thought I, I'm the guy driving, right? And I've come to such peace that, no, I'm actually on the bus. I'm not driving it, right? And I figure out, or I try to figure out, what is it that I'm supposed to do? You know, how can I have the best or, or the greatest impact in a really, really positive way by using my skill set? Um, as you know, I write very emotionally charged, reality-based, you know, stories. Um, so I want to connect people, right? And again, that also comes from the Gulf War, where, uh, you know, for three hours, I felt like I was really alone, Um mm -hmm. And then I decide, you know, I, I, when I get home, I'm, I'm, you know, not if, but when I get home, I'm going to chase my dream down and I'm become this published author. And I'm going to write stories that connect other people, right? So that you don't ever think, if you read one of my books and one of my stories, then you should really feel like there's somebody in the boat with you, right? That we're all together, we're connected. It's, you know, and we're all riding this roller coaster, right? We get our highs and lows. But I think that when, when I look at art, whether it's film or it's, it's, um, you know, I have a friend who's a, who's a renowned painter, Brian Fox. I write stories and I look at the work across the board and I think it's just connecting people, right? It's just at a real human basic level, just connecting us so that we feel like, you know, we're all in this together and we're not alone. Mm -hmm. I loved your movie as there were multiple moments where I held my heart, I mm -hmm. laughed, I smiled, I teared up. And it just goes back to what you said previously, that human connection piece of we all have our own grief and loss story, but we're all so connected and can support each other as well. Yeah, it right. Absolutely. And I think that bled through. I mean, the one thing I learned about the movie is, you know, when I write or when you write a story, right, you have unlimited space to do that in. Right. And then we ended up doing the audio podcast drama. A couple of years after the book came out. So the book's perennial, right? It comes out every year. People enjoy it. It's a collection of of these novellas. But the Thursday Night Club is the anchor within that, you know, within that book. Um, and I've got amazing feedback. And what I love about it is it's nice to hear from people. But I also wonder sometimes, you know, who's reading it that ne that I've never heard from. You know what I mean? You, you don't know what's going to happen. And I love that. You can push it out into the world. And it's not mine anymore. It becomes somebody else's. Um and that's the connection too, right? Even if you don't, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but the audio podcast drama, they ended, we ended up um, recording that in Brooklyn. Uh, Kathleen Turner uh, was the angel, the voice of the angel. Um, and at the time, it was just you know just around COVID time, so they had some young Broadway stars that came in, some YouTube stars. And it's six episodes. You can download it for free, right, on Apple. Um, and I love that too because you had a team of people that got together, took my original idea and then you know I, I wrote that with Lou Aronica as well we had to tweak some things to make it fit and then you hear everybody else's talents right so it's like me it starts with me and then I hand it off to you and then you add your love and your soul into it and then it you know it moves on and then mm -hmm. fast forward two years from then it's the film right so insanely talented crew 
and cast. Uh, Valerie Smaldone was the um, was the director on it. Monty and Matthew is the producers. Um, it really was a true blessing. Like it's, I, I'm not sure when you looked at some of the challenges, right, that took place behind the scenes. Uh, it was almost miraculous that it got done, right? But it was wild how the right people were there to to get it done, right? Mm -hmm. Which, again, from a faith perspective, it was just all right. We're, we're just on the bus, right? Like things are being <laughs> taken care of, right? Um, but again, I mean, they brought in Gloria Gaynor, right, who played the doctor in the film. Um, some young talent because these are college kids, and and they knocked it out of the park, and I could feel. You know, I was on set one day, they, they filmed it out in New Milford, Connecticut, and I walked up to one of the primary actresses and I said, I could feel it. Like I wrote it, but you are reciting this and I can feel it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just me, it's it's you, right? It's it's your essence and your energy and just amazing, such a blessing. Mm -hmm. There definitely, I felt a lot of emotion with each one of the five friends. Right. What I loved about each of them is I saw a piece of myself of what I needed to feel right along right. with the character, even though it was a little different than what I'm going through. I still felt that piece. Right. Right. I think that's the trick, right? It's all in the character development. So I, right from the, from the start that, you know, you take that pen out and you start going at it. If I don't understand the character or I don't feel that character, then there's no way the reader or the viewer, right, uh, for a film is going to either, right? So, again, I mean, I write tear jerkers primarily for a female audience, right? So if I'm not laughing, I don't expect my 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 <laughs> audience to laugh. If I'm not crying, I don't expect my audience to cry. And the good news is, is you know, I've lived long enough to be really comfortable in my own skin. Uh, and I'll show up to conferences. You know, I'm six feet tall. I weigh 240, right? I'll walk in background of military, law enforcement. And I've sat in the back of a room in Cape Cod, and this is hilarious, but I was, you know, getting ready to get up to the podium to speak. And I turned to one of the women, and there's literally a couple hundred people in the room. And it's just me, some other guy who looks lost, and another gentleman who's holding his wife's pocketbook, right? And I turned to her, I said, have you ever heard this gentleman speak? And she said, no. And I said, he's terrible. And she said, oh my God, you know, we paid to come hear him and, you know, get a, I said, well, hopefully the sandwiches are good. But what was so funny is here's a woman who reads my stuff and doesn't know it's me, right? Because I don't present that way, right? So to be able to do those tearjerkers, it's another way of me teaching. We have four children, teaching both my sons that, you know, if you fall down and you scrape your knee, you better get up. I don't want to hear you crying. There's no whining, right? Mm. If there's something that hurts your soul, I mean, the same heart, right, that, that, that allowed me to stand up and fight for people who couldn't fight for themselves is also permitted me to cry right and i've shared that with my kids all of them and i think with with the stories that we tell or that i tell and then you know we end up collaborating on um the same essence bleeds through right don't we're human right i mean we're all you know there's times you suffer there's times that you know that you celebrate but we're kind of all walking you know even though we're not on our own path um we're all walking a you know a path Right. So just be mm -hmm. kind to each other. And I love the Thursday night club for that. It's really, it's all about kindness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your journey from writing the novella to now the feature film, walk us through some of the steps leading up to where it is now. Yeah, it's amazing. So starts with the novel or the novella uh, that gets published. It comes out again every year and, and, you know, people really enjoyed it. You fast forward a couple of years, we get to the audio podcast drama. Now I'm, ex I'm really excited, like old school radio. And, you know, it's hot. I'm not a salesperson. And like, I'd love, if I could, I would just sit at my desk and write, right? But you have to be out there connecting with other people in order for them mm -hmm. to see your stuff or to read your stuff. Um, but as soon as I found out, oh my God, the podcast is free. People can download it for free. I'm not trying to sell something to somebody, right? And I want to share that. Um, so that was amazing to be able to share that. And, you know, to have Kathleen Turner, right? Like her voice, that gruff voice, it was just amazing, right? Um, and then they did an amazing job. Like the entire cast uh, did an incredible job. That came out, did very, very well. It was at the top of the charts for a while on downloadable podcasts and people can still get it. So you can, you know, for your audience, you can go out and get it for free. Uh, and I thought that was it. And then two years later, Lou Veronica calls me and says, hey, you, you know, we want to do the movie. And I'm like, oh my God, dream come true, right? I mean, this is, this is my dream come true. Because it, it takes a book and it, it just widens that audience, right? 
uh, and now I can really start to share everything that I've done with people who wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have known my work. Um, so there was a lot of work involved, right? So there was a rewrite, there were multiple rewrites, there were people involved, there were people that left the project. You know, it all has to do with funding, right? So God bless the people that go out and chase the money down because that's, you know, without the money, you can't get any of this done. Uh, and people did, you know, Lou was, you know, smart enough to bring in, and he's a smart man. He brought in the right people uh, to, you know, to get this stuff done. And then I went down with my daughter, which was, you know, the joy of joy. So my, my daughter Isabella is, um, you know, she's a performing arts major and, and uh, you know, has been singing, dancing since she was a little kid. So this is my way of connecting my passion with hers. So you couldn't ask for a greater gift than that. And we went down. She got into hair and makeup. Uh, Valerie was beyond kind, you know, and, and got her into the film and a couple different shots. Um, she was able to meet some people and really be on set to, to you know, see how this thing unfolded. Uh, I was excited. They also had Doritos there in the green room. So I was excited about that. Uh, <laughs> but just to see the work that went into it. And, and again, um, you have to be in the right frame of mind. Like, you know, years ago, it was like, you know, I write something, it's mine, right? So you like you hover over, like, you know, some kids trying to cheat on your math test in the fourth grade. And now I realize that in order for me to really spread my, my work out into the world, I also need to be surrounded with people, right? That have those same, those same wishes, right? They have those same, you know, ideals where, you know, we may not, um, you know, agree on all of the details, but we're pushing out this story that's going to have an incredible impact. And with the Thursday Night Club, you know, one of the kids, as you know, ends up donating bone marrow and saves this little girl, right, who suffered from leukemia. So Be the Match, which is the, the national organization, ends up, you know, Valerie ends up connecting with them. And it's just amazing how resourceful she is, right? And she goes out and, and, and you know, introduces the organization to this piece, and they've actually gotten behind it. Uh, which is amazing, right? And and I think about that too, Lori, right? Can you imagine if somebody watches that there's an A club and donates bone marrow and saves somebody? And I don't even care if I find out about it, right? Just the idea that that could happen. Mm -hmm. It's a just to be a part of that is amazing, right? It's it's mm -hmm. almost like all right, it's worth worth all the time and effort in the world, right? To to do something like that. Um, but to be on set in New Milford and then have watched them, you know, go through post-production, this it's not as, as glamorous as a lot of people think, right? So they'll set up a shot and then they'll shoot it and then they'll set up the same shot, shoot it, set up the same shot, shoot it. And you're like, ooh. But they have to get it right. The angles have to be right, right? There can be no distractions. So there's so much that goes into the execution of it. And then when you get to that point, I think you're probably two-thirds of the way there. You know, the final third being post-production where they put – you know, they put some magician behind a curtain, right, who takes all those puzzle pieces and puts it together. And, they, you know, they do their sound and everything else. Um, so the final outcome for me has been a, it's been a joy, right, because it's something that I'll be able to, to take pride in for the rest of my life. But more importantly, something that I can share and use as a foundation to stand on and do other other projects. Um, so truly, it's been a, it's been an unbelievable blessing in. We had a soft launch uh, with Pure Flix, which is owned by Sony. Uh, so it came out in November. Um, I went to a couple of, you know, watch parties, which was really, really interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to sit in a room and kind of, you know, because usually like if as a writer, if, you know, I write a book, somebody buys the book or goes to the library, they read the book. I'm not in their house to see their reactions to it. Right. So <laughs> to watch the film play out and to sit in the same room was was really eye opening. But it was you know, people were more than gracious. I, I got some great feedback from it. Um, and it just inspires you, right, to go on and, and, and do more things, right, which is exactly what, what we're planning to do. Um, but when I think about the future of the Thursday Night Club, they recently announced that they picked up, uh, well, they've had it for a while, but a, a, a big distributor. Um, so it's, I think, the beginning of March, uh, the film is going to be released on other streaming services to include Amazon, Google, Apple, right. And they're also going to, you know, burn DVDs. So it'll be in Walmarts throughout the country, uh, which is really cool. So my mother can have a copy of that, right? I may get three of her, for, you know, three of them for Christmas for her. <laughs> just, uh, but, just, but just cool. But again, nothing I did, right? I mean, it all started, uh, you know, when you think about the lifespan, and I do, I'll sit back and think, my God, I, you know, here I am trying to, find parking spots right in Martha's Vineyard so that I could finish this story 
And then, you know, the, the young summer police officer on his Segway is mocking, you know, mocking the back tires and I make friends with them and it's just hilarious. And then I, I sit down and I write this story and you have no idea where it's going to go. Right. But I think if you have the best of intentions and because <laughs> I think even the premise of this story is bigger than I am, it's always been bigger than I am. Right. It's just me. All right. Let me try to get it out into the world. And once I did, it just, it just really took off. And I, you know, I thank Lou, I thank Valerie, Monty, Matthew. I mean, there was so many people involved and, and people say, oh, you know, Steve, it's, it's your story. Well, it was, you know, and mm -hmm. now it's our story. And I think that collaboration, again, leads to, you know, bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. I love how each one of your five characters, the different ways that they connected and what really spoke to their heart of how they needed to connect to connect in that moment. Right. I think, I think, um, it's easier for me, right. Mm -hmm. To develop characters in a book, even a novella, I can develop them. I can tell you the backstory. I can tell you what their fears are, what their loves are. You know, if, if, uh, you know, if Kevin, for instance, is impoverished, he comes from a background where there's not a lot of money. So obviously he's going to be leaning toward, if I'm going to help somebody, it's, it's to help them, you know, stay in school. We're going to, we're going to start this scholarship. Um, a lot more challenging for somebody like Valerie, who's a director, to, to build that backstory in, right? And be able to explain visually and through dialogue, right? But this is why this kid, you know, is really intent on, on, on helping somebody based on this, way because obviously he feels that passion for it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and I love some of the spins, right? Where, uh, you know, Jesse and, and Ava, like all of them, right? Whether it was, you know, in the, in the elderly care facility, um, which is based on a story that I wrote years and years ago. Um, and I thought it was just amazing because, you know, you walk into one of those places and if they suffer from anything, it's loneliness, right? And, you know, you, you, you try to, you know, bring somebody like Ava in there who wants to make a difference. It, it, it makes a huge difference, right, to, to, to the people that live in there. So, but yeah, each one of them was very specific. Um, and I think that the way, you know, Valerie and, and the crew kind of, flesh that out was pretty amazing giving the limited space right that they had to do that in mm -hmm. i really appreciate appreciated the elderly care parts right. of you know what she needed was for somebody to sit with her and right. that didn't seem like that big of a deal but it was the whole world huge have somebody yeah. sit with her. right mm -hmm. yeah enormous right mrs lecomte sitting there and and uh who did a wonderful job in the film. And I've since seen her in commercials and all kinds of shows and she's just <laughs> crushing it out there. But, um, but yeah, each one of them, I, I just had this, this, such this fondness for, because if you, if you're really intent on giving, right. And I, and by no stretch am I a saint, right. If anything, I'm trying to, you know, like anybody else, I'm trying to pay off some bad karma from some point in my life, but, um, I don't think it's that hard, right. You can walk out the door, you can bump into somebody and they need help. So the question is, if you really commit to something like that, there's no reason it can't happen. And what I what I loved about the story was the ages of the people that did it. So because they're younger, like I think it's easier for me, having lived as long as I have, I can look back and connect the dots and things make sense, right? I was, even the toughest times of my life, I was exactly where I was supposed to be. That's what led me to where I am today. When you're a teenager or you're going through college, you know, early 20s, you can't connect dots. You don't have enough dots to connect, right? So to be able to go out into the world and commit yourself to actually helping somebody and then realizing that the gift is, oh, my God, that's really what it feels like to give, right? My, my life is richer as, as a result of it. You can call it your soul, whatever you want to, you know, whatever your, your faith is. But there's a value. There's a tremendous value in that. And it could, if you did it at that age, it could really turn you know, which direction that you're going to head into, right? Which um, I love the idea that the Thursday night club, there are chapters where people can join the Thursday night club. They can go and, you know, there's, there's you know, Bible groups and, and whatnot that are, that are viewing the, the film. And they're trying to get their younger, you know, people out there, you know, to, to do something good for somebody that could never repay them, right? And that to me is the true, the true gift. Mm -hmm. What's the way that you've served within your own community? Um, so I served, I served my country in the first Gulf War. I was very young then, and I came back old, at least, you know, <laughs> mentally and spiritually old. But, you know, it's funny how the toughest 
moment in my life became the greatest opportunity, right? And I think you know, I went to the Gulf War for the folks who, who haven't heard my story, but um, I flipped a Humvee in Iraq, uh, in southern Iraq, and it was either the Americans who were going to find me or the Iraqis. And I did a lot of praying, and I, and I remember feeling very alone at that, at that point, but also making myself a promise, right? Not if, but when. I'm, I'm going to chase my life's too short. I need to, to do what I – I'd rather – fail at something that I love, right, than succeed at something that I hate. And at the time, I was working in the prison system. I went in there at 19 years old. Um, so I served my community for 10 years inside, you know, inside the prison. But the coolest thing now for me is because I have a platform to speak, you know, I'm able to, to attend events or to help with certain things. My wife and I run an annual fundraiser called Laughter and Wishes. Um, so 15 years ago, and you're going to love this, right? Uh, my friend Don, his wife Tracy, you know, wink, wink. Their son, and it's a girl in the movie, but their son Cameron uh, is diagnosed with leukemia. And we run, it was a Thursday night, I'll never forget, it was in a small uh, hall in Fall River, Massachusetts. And we raised $24,000 for this kid. And I got up and I did, you know, five minutes of comedy. I think I would rather get back on a plane and go to war. It was that terrifying, right? But it was talking about a life experience. But it was just awesome. And we had like seven or eight comedians and people were super generous. And we got to the end of it and I said to my wife, I don't, I put so much work into this that I don't think we can just let it go at one. And we've been doing it ever since. And we've done it, well, COVID messes up for a couple of years, but we've done, uh, I think, 14. We've raised over $250,000. Uh, we bought everything from handicapped vans to, you know, worked with a wish come true. We work from, for, uh, work with Make a Wish, so we'll either align with an organization uh, that's helping kids out, or if there's a private party that who really needs help. The last one we did was uh, just recently, a couple months ago, where uh, we put 900 people in the room. I got up on the microphone and hosted the night, and we raised forty thousand dollars for this kid. And this is for him. To, you know, to do everything you can to walk again, right? Because it costs 175 bucks an hour for them to use the equipment, right? So it was amazing. And the best, one of the best parts of the night is my, my kids are right there with me. Yeah. We have a comment coming in for you, Steve. Cove Queen Janine says, great message, movie and book. Thank wow. you, Janine. I actually know Janine. She's a very talented writer in her own uh, regard. So I really appreciate that. And Janine's, you know, she wears her heart on her sleeve. I don't know too many people that help more, more folks than she does. So this is right up her alley from Jump Street. But thank you, Janine. You are kind. And, uh, and again, she's super talented. Thank you for being here, Janine. Have you been given a sign, Stephen, on a direction that you need to take at some point in your life? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, which is really strange for somebody to say that because it's maybe even two years ago. I don't think I could have told you that. Right. But and, and, and the only way I know this is, that, you know, writing used to be what I did. And I realized a couple of years ago, it's not what I do. It's who I am. Mm. Right. So whether I, I chose it or it chose me, like my grandfather, when I was a kid and he passed when I was 12. But, you know, you talk about somebody having a profound effect on you. And he was a phenomenal storyteller. So he never put pen to paper, but I mean, he could spin a tale. He, you didn't know whether he was telling the truth, whether he was making it up, he'd make you laugh, cry, but he taught me the power of words. Um, and his nickname was Swamp Yankee. So when, when I get into the Gulf War, you pick a call sign and my call sign was Swamp Yankee, right? In the Gulf War. The promise that I made to myself was also, I think, a promise that I made to him and to my father and to, my entire family, right? That I was given a certain skill set. You can either, I think you know when you're young, right? What you're good at or what you're not good at. Um, you can either cultivate that or not. And it was di it was a difficult decision. When I came home, I mean, I probably at one point could have ran one of the prisons and been, been very successful at it, but I would have been miserable, right? Surrounded by all that darkness. Mm -hmm. um, so probably one of the most courageous things I've ever done in my life was to walk away from something that I was successful at and then take a shot at this where the rejection rate hub is around 97%, right? And it's, <laughs> but I figured, you know what, if I'm going to commit and dedicate myself, then I'm going all in, right? And I'm going to devote my entire life to it. And I have, but I'll tell you, two years ago, it was almost like, um, I was just at peace. I was walking the dog and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's next, right? And I, in, in a lot of times when I'm in thought or prayer, it's me asking for a little bit of direction so, so they don't, 
because we only have a limited amount of time. So where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, please let, like, let me, let me get cracked up the side of the head, right. To know that I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And there's projects recently that I've turned down, which would have been very lucrative, but I think about, it's not, I'm not writing just for the, for the purpose of, of making money. We need to make money. We need it to live. But, uh, at this point in my life, it seems like there's a higher purpose because I feel, you know, I mean, we only get so much runway, right? So I better be working on the right projects. Absolutely. What has grief and loss taught you? Um, it's, it's taught me the value of life. Um, I, I, you know, I mourn so deeply for my father mm. and I even get emotional talking about it now, but it just showed me the depth of love, right? That's the price you pay for it. And I'll pay it. And my kids will pay it. So I think grief and loss, it, it, it also teaches you a lot about yourself. Um, you know, when I was younger, you know, you, you put on this face and this persona and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the tough guy and everything. And now, you know, I, I don't want to give your audience the wrong impression. I don't go around the, you know, the town weeping, but... You know, if I show up to a place and, and there's something that strikes me, I don't care if, you know, my wife and I are at a, at a play or, or, you know, we go, we go to a wake of somebody who's beloved. I, I have no problem with my emotions. And for me, it just, you know, and I know it's cliche, right? But if, if, if you don't experience any of the bad, you could never appreciate any of the good. And there's so much good, right, that we take for granted. I think most of our lives we take for granted. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you watch people like, you know, and, and there's these things. Some of the greatest people I've ever met in my life were born or, or created. Their character was created from hardship. Right. Um, so I think about the worst times in my life. Like if I don't go to the Gulf War, I probably don't run a comedy show for kids. I don't write stories like the Thursday Night Club. Right. So I had to see that. I had to experience that and feel that right, right down to my bone marrow, right? In order to say, all right, you know, life's bigger than me, uh, and I need to do everything I can to to, to help other people. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Speaking to that, that we all go through very specific things that lead us to another ending point that we could not possibly understand without walking right that path. Yeah, I recently had a friend, you know. It, it, you know, people who have, you know, loved ones who pass away and you'll show up in my sympathies and my condolences. And a couple of years ago, I had a friend who, who had a you know, terrible loss. Mm -hmm. And I went to him and I sat with him and I didn't say anything. And we sat together. And I think it was the smartest thing I've ever done. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it doesn't have to be, right? It's I'm not making it better, right? You're not making it better. It's just, you're not alone. I'm here with you. That's it. Yeah. It actually reminds me when I lost my voice for 12 months, those were the gifts that I treasured the most was when people would just come and sit under the tree with me and hold my hand. And it right. was just being, Yeah, there was no, you need to be this or you need to have a voice or nothing like that. It was just, you're enough yeah. here in this moment. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we all, and maybe that's the reason that it happened to you, right? Like, you know, not that I'm checking for reasons on everything, but yeah. <laughs> I do think about the bigger things in life, right? And you say, okay, why would, why would I go through that? And then if you really give it a, enough thought, hmm. right? It shows you, right? It reveals the people around you. It, it's, you know, and, and I really do believe that. I, there's times I'll get down, right? You'll be in traffic and I'm like, oh my God, people are so nasty, right? Mm -hmm. And then my wife and I run this event and 900 people show up and they're just gushing all this love and support and you're thinking, yeah, maybe that maybe, you know, maybe the news doesn't cover it. Right. But there's more good out there than bad. There really is. I mean, I've been around the bad, right. I went to war. I, I worked in a prison for many years. Um, I've witnessed the bad and it's there, but it's a small percentage. Right. So the focus needs to switch to the other side. I know it doesn't sell, you know, newspapers and, you know, um, commercials, but. Yeah, I absolutely but, agree with you, though. There's so much light and good and love in the world. There is. Around us. When was a moment when a friend supported you through a tough time? Well, it's been countless, 
right? It's been countless. I've, I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with people that have big hearts, you know? Um, you know, I, I went through a divorce, you know, I, I've, I've lost, you know, people who are very, very close to me. Um, I think probably having gone to war, you know, some of the people that stepped up and were supportive of me, I think saved me. Right. When I say save me, it's it's, a, I, it's one of the things people don't realize about going to war is there's, they think there's a glory that's assigned to it. Right. I mean, we're very, really, really human. I, I probably grew up the same way most people grew up. So when you go to Iraq and you see people die or you see things happen, it's not something that anybody should see or experience. Right. Other people around the world who are not as fortunate as, uh, as us. Right. May experience more of that. But when you when you take that in, it changes you. Right. So I knew who I was when I was eight years old. I knew exactly who I was. I was also a storyteller. I was like my grandfather. I'm a bit of a clown, but I have a, you know, I'm, I'm a really sensitive person. So all of a sudden I, I take all that, I bottle it up and I mask it and I get in the gym and I train and I train and, um, you know, we, we get trained in, in combat. Like I was really good at what I did. I was very confident what I did. Um, and when I came home, there were uh, a couple different people who I could be myself around. Uh, I think who saved the eight year old, right? And mm-hmm. one of the greatest fears is being stuck. I didn't want to be stuck in 1991. And I was terrified of that, right? Like, you know, I've seen all these things and, and you've seen people like from the Korean war or the Vietnam, you know, Vietnam yeah. war where they're still living it right They're in 1968. And I think, Oh my God, like if I, if I get shot, I get shot, right? If I die, that's the game. I mean, I'm wearing a uniform, they're wearing a uniform. It is what it is, but please don't let me come home and be stuck for the next 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, and there were people that bailed me out of that and I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. I love how you said save the eight year old. Cause we oftentimes forget that that inner child piece is so right. much a part of who we are. <laughs> yeah, it is. I couldn't write without the eight year old. Like I, even though I have a much broader vocabulary that I have a lot more life experience. If I don't turn on my imagination where I believe what it is that I'm telling, even though I'm writing reality based fiction, like there's times I'll show up, you know, at these different events and people come up to me and they'll hug me, Lori. Right. And I'm like, woof, I don't even know who this person is. Right. <laughs> but they know me. I mean, they've read the menu. They've read lawn dots and lemonade. Like they, they've read my work. They know exactly who I am. Cause they, I put it all, all out there. Right. And, but it's an odd exchange. It's a really odd exchange. But without that eight-year-old, I can't believe who these characters are. I can't believe who these stories are. And those same folks will come up to me and say, you know, this obviously is based on, you know, true life as fiction. I mean, it's all, you know, I put it all together. You, you know, you write about who you know, where you've been, you know, what you've done. But I'm making up most of it. I'm embellishing the heck out of most of it. And But I believe it so much that I sell it like it's real. And this way here, again, you can get in that boat and feel like somebody else understands where you're, you know, where you're at. Mm-hmm. We're going to take it to the inner child question segment, moving in from the eight-year-old. Are you ready, Steve? Yes, I am. I think I am. <laughs> First question, who were some of your best friends when you were a kid? My brothers. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of friends. We were blessed. We, you know, we grew up in the, uh, in the eighties. Uh, and I love the eighties. I've since written two stories about the eighties. I think it was the last age of innocence, right? We rode our bikes. We weren't on tablets or, or, or phones. Um, but it was the neighborhood kids. It was everybody that I was surrounded with, you know, my best friend from my neighborhood, I ended up going to basic training with in the army. We went to military police school together. Uh, but really my brothers, I grew up with two brothers and we, we remain close to this day. So I'm really grateful for that. Mm-hmm. What were some of your favorite things that you like to do with your brothers? Uh, baseball. We were fanatical about playing baseball. Um, I have, I mean, we were, and I say this in the, in the kindest way, but we were kind of maniacs, right? Like we were training each other for, <laughs> so whether it was the GI Joe command center, right. And, you know, it always ended up in a fight or, you know, somebody taking a, but I think about those things now and I'm like, oh my God, like nobody knows me the way my brothers know me. Right. And I, I don't care how big, I have a brother who's a full bird colonel in the Air Force. I have another brother who's, who's an engineer who worked for NASCAR. Right. So we kind of all went off on our different paths, really committed, you know, to making something of our lives. Um, 
but it's funny. I'll I'll go to these events and people are like, oh, you know, best selling author. I'll get introduced as this, and you know, I have one of my brothers with me, and he'll you know poke fun at me, and he's right to do so, right? He ke he keeps me grounded as it's my job to keep him grounded. So it's a blast. Yeah. Second question: As a teenager, what were some of your most memorable or funny experiences with friends? I owned a convertible uh, 65 Buick Special, right? Powder blue on blue. We lived near Horseneck Beach. So I live on the coast. We're very fortunate to do that. I didn't come from a place of money, um, but we spent a lot of time down the beach, right? And I've, I've really learned. Uh, I'm a water sign, right? So I feel really, really comfortable by the water. And um, I think about the memories of that time that was so innocent and pure, even if we thought we were doing something wrong, you know, by most people's standards, it's kind of laughable, right? But uh, I'm, I feel so grateful that we grew up what we did because we were able to go down and just become beach bums, right? When we were teenagers and, you know, drive around our cars. But again, driving movie theaters, roller skating rinks, we were kind of the last to go through that stuff. So um, very blessed to grow up when, when I did. Yeah, the powder blue car. That makes my heart so happy. That's my favorite color. <laughs> powder blue, yeah. Mine too. And the thing got smashed. I was sitting at a stop sign and some guy ran into me and I couldn't find parts for it because it was a 65 Buick. Um, but, you know, I still think about that. So as soon as I mentioned 65 Buick special, right? Powder blue on blue. You know, someday if I make enough money and, and uh, I can find one, I'm, I'm buying it again, right? It'll be a little more expensive this time, but can be on your dream board exactly <laughs> exactly absolutely before we end today can you share with our listeners and viewers what living a creatively abundant life means to you it's everything that i've done has created a life worth living for me right so again super cliche right but people i don't understand people and i'm not trying to we all have different circumstances right and consequences that we have to deal with but Again, it took me more courage to quit something that I was really, really good at and I was successful at to go do something that I loved, right? And I know for some people they can't do that because they're supporting folks and whatnot. But I would say this, right? If you love to sing, then sing. You don't have to be paid to do it. You know, there are people all the time, well, how, you know, how'd you get writing? Well, and I'm not trying to be cocky by saying this, right? I'm not even trying to be funny. Get a pad of paper and a pen. I'm not the only guy who owns a pen. Go write doesn't matter if you share it or you don't share it, right? I've written, in order to heal myself, I've written more letters that I've never sent out, right? Just as that, that are kind of cathartic to me. So for me, there's those two sides to the brain. You have to exercise both. And please, no matter what it is that you love, be creative. If, it, if, mm -hmm. if you don't want to be on stage, go to the theater, right? If that's what it is that you love. Because, it, it, again, it connects us and it just brings you to a place where um, I think that's where the beauty is, you know? I really don't. Mm -hmm. There is nothing, I agree with you, more beautiful for me than seeing somebody like in the essence of what just makes them happy. Right. <laughs> right. It's beautiful. It really is. It, it really, really. I, I, I love, and this is so strange, but I love writing so much. The first 10, 15 minutes are absolute, you know, torture right getting that train out of the station but you know Laurie, once you once that train starts chugging right then you're like oh my there's no better place in the world right none and if you're doing it the right way it's like you know sean connery in that movie finding forrester right well what are you what are you waiting on while well, I'm, I'm thinking don't think right mm -hmm. right that it, almost as if it's come from a, another place right so put it down capture it and and uh, and then share it share it with the world but i don't you know I, i've told a lot of right some of the best writing that I've ever read in 30 years is unpublished. And it doesn't matter. Like if it's in you, get it out. You know what I mean? Like for me, I, the, the biggest fear that I have is time, right? And it's not because, oh, I don't understand mortality, but I have this I need to do. I have that that I need to do. The people that come up to me and I'm sure they do the same with you. I have this idea and I think, well, I have a lot of ideas. What I need more of is time, right? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go to the other side, right, with, with these stories still inside me. I want to get them all out. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an honor to sit and chat with you, Stephen. The honor's been mine, my friend. I really appreciate it. I've been following you. You're crushing <laughs> it. I'm a big fan. So thank you so much for having me on.
Likewise. And where can our listeners and viewers find you to see the books that you have out? Yeah. So I'm, you know, obviously Amazon's, you know, running the world now, right? So if, if you can, I'm, you know, my stuff's in the libraries, you know, go to the mom and pop shops. Uh, if you have to, you go to Amazon, right? I mean, it's the way of the world. But um, the Thursday Night Club, um, you know, you can start looking for that in March. If you have pure flicks, please go on and, and check the movie out. Uh, otherwise, you know, you may see it on an end cap at Walmart, or you can go on Amazon and, and, and uh, you know, watch it as it's streaming. But um, really proud of that story. And I'm hoping that it has more, you know, more and more impacts on the world because I think it has the potential to make to make a difference, a positive difference. I am putting a plug in for Steven as it was one of my favorite films that I've watched in quite some time. Um, definitely go to Pure Flix and when it opens up, um, Steven will be sure to post it and I'll also yes. on my page as well so you can find other outlets. Thank you so much, Steven. You are fantastic. Thank you, my friend. I feel the same about you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate this so much. You're so welcome. And remember, as you go about the rest of your week, to find the things that are working within your life. You are the creator of your own story. What steps will you take next? Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a beautiful rest of your week.